Welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. No. This is Creepy, a podcast dedicated to sharing the most famous, chilling, and disturbing creepy pastas and urban legends in the world. Whether these stories truly happened or are simply fabrications is for you to decide. These stories may contain graphic depictions of violence and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Creepy presents The 31 Days of Horror Day 11 The Amazing World of Gumball The Grieving I've always loved the Cartoon Network. When I was growing up, it was my favorite channel to watch. Even today, it has some good shows, like Adventure Time and Regular Show. One of the newest shows on the network, The Amazing World of Gumball, is a cute and mildly entertaining show. Not really my cup of tea, it's a little immature. But my little brother seems to like it a lot. One day I was watching Adult Swim and I realized I'd been up so late that I hadn't even kept track of the time. It was already 4 a.m. I don't recall ever watching AS this late. So I stayed awake to see what happened when it ended. A little bumper showed up at the bottom of the screen during a commercial break. It said that a special episode of The Amazing World of Gumball was about to come on. I was a little confused about an episode of a very popular new show coming on this early. But I was bored and decided I'd watch it, thinking it might come on later in the day so I could spoil it for my brother. It's sort of mean, I know. The flashy and energetic intro theme played, although it was played a little differently than I recall. The music was a little different, and the show's logo wasn't animated. Its colors were done rather sloppily as well, almost like something a little kid would do on a doodle board or a glow board. I ignored it, assuming that it was just done for this special episode. The title of the episode was The Grieving. A sort of sad title, but I didn't really pay too much attention. It began with Gumball, the show's 12-year-old protagonist, standing alone facing the corner of his dimly lit classroom. He looked absolutely miserable. A far cry from the cheerful demeanor he usually had. There was no one else in the room. Not even his best friend and adopted brother Darwin the goldfish. And the windows in the room clearly showed the night sky outside. I was really starting to get confused. Why would he be at school at night? And why was he standing in the corner all sad and alone? After about what seemed like a minute of Gumball standing somberly in the corner, the scene suddenly changed. We were in Gumball's house. Once again, the scene is silent and a little disquieting. Richard, Gumball's enormous rabbit father, walks in from the kitchen. He looked even more miserable than Gumball had in the previous scene. Richard isn't wearing his usual attire. He's dressed in a fancy black suit, a little uncharacteristic of him, as he's usually a slob. He sighs and slumps down onto the sofa and starts sobbing intensely, sounding like someone who had just lost something important. I was starting to get a little creeped out. Where was the silly, fun cartoon that I usually look forward to watching with my younger brother? This was something completely different. I was beginning to think that this might have been something the creators did as an experiment or something. A test of the animation or sound, perhaps. Though it couldn't have been. Aside from the opening theme, which was still different from the final shows, the episode had been much quieter than it usually was. Only subtle sounds and very little music. And the animation was not anything to write home about either. It was done a little bit like an amateur flash on Newgrounds. The character design was somewhat sloppy and rushed looking, and the real life backgrounds used for the show looked different. As confused and somewhat frightened as I was, for some reason, I kept watching. 
Poor Richard was still sobbing on the sofa as the front door opened suddenly, making me jump a little bit at such a loud noise. And Gumball's mother, Nicole, a blue cat like him, stepped in. Like Richard, she wasn't wearing her usual outfit. For some reason, she was in a black dress and wearing a pretty black hat to match. Nicole sat down on the couch to comfort her husband, although she was looking a bit saddened herself. By this point, Richard's crying had begun to get more pained and miserable sounding. This wasn't the normal cartoon crying on the show. This was realistic and almost depressing crying. I almost felt like sobbing myself. Finally, after what seemed like hours, the sad scene at their home ended as it shifted back to the school. We weren't in Gumball's classroom this time. We were in Principal Brown's office. Nicole and Richard were there in their usual clothes, looking more normal and happy than they had been before, but still slightly worried. Principal Brown, however, looked extremely sad. He quietly and somberly informed them that their children, Anais and Darwin, were not present after lunch earlier that day. They hadn't been seen at all the rest of the day. Nicole was instantly furious at him. She began spouting various insults and calls at him that I don't think would have made it on a more mature program like regular show. I was laughing at it because it seemed sort of funny for Nicole to flip out in this manner and start swearing like a sailor in a G-rated cartoon. But my outlook soon changed when Principal Brown told her something else after she finally quieted down. His eyes began to tear up as he informed them that they eventually were found but they'd not been found alive. He then went into graphic and nearly nauseating detail describing how their bodies were found, their parents sitting in utter shock. I could hardly believe what was happening. How could such a cheery and fun kids show be taking such a dark and twisted turn? I was considering turning the television off, but I was too scared to be left in the dark by now nearly frozen by fear and disturbed intensely at the terrible things that he was saying. Another flashback. The scene was earlier that day, and the animation in this scene was even worse than earlier. I don't remember it very clearly, but I think he began his recollection by saying that the school had called the police department when they first turned up missing, believing that the kid had simply run off and decided to skip school. They said it was very uncharacteristic of both Darwin and Anais to skip school like delinquents. Darwin was a little naive and a bit ditzy, but he was a good kid and wouldn't have even dreamed of doing something like that. And Anais was even less likely to run away. She was a straight-A student despite being only four, which also troubled the police, seeing as a defenseless four-year-old girl was missing as well as an older boy. The school had been thoroughly checked. So the police started to search the heavily wooded areas outside of the school. It took a little time for the police to discover the horrifying fate of Anais. In a small clearing outside of the school, Anais's head was found in a small box. You likely would have expected something like this to have been shown in the show's cutesy art style. But it was nothing like that at all. Realistic blood covered the box, inside and out. While Anais's head was done in the normal style but it was drenched in blood and some other fluids. Not all of them hers, apparently. There was a note in the box, seemingly written in her blood. It was never stated during the episode what exactly was written on the note, but apparently led to the rest of her remains in Darwin's heavily mutilated corpse. What I remember most about this scene was how out of place it seemed. All the blood and gore from Darwin and Anais's slaughtered and dismembered remains was done in a very realistic and disturbing way. It looked like the scene had been taken from a crime scene photograph done by a professional, not something from a cartoon. The way this scene was animated was different from most of the show as well. You may know that characters from this series are done in vastly differing animation styles, from flash animation to CGI and I think that there's even a character done by someone putting their chin upside down to make a face. This particular scene wasn't like anything I'd ever seen on the show before. Every little detail on Darwin's face was clearly illustrated. He looked a little like a zombie. His face was very pale, 
His eyes have been gouged out by someone. And Hayes fared no better, or what was left of her anyway. She was naked, and her stomach had been slit open. Her intestines had been strewn around the trees and bushes in the woods, done once again in a very morbid and realistic style. I was feeling very ill by the time this incredibly disturbing flashback had come to an end, so I quickly ran to the bathroom to vomit. I was feeling better after up chucking, so I realized that I had had good timing and had run to the bathroom during a commercial break. It was then that I noticed that the show had been running twice as long. It usually ran for 11 minutes, but this episode was running for about 30. By then I was wondering if there was any information on The Grieving on IMDb or something. So while the commercials were still playing, I looked up some information about this episode on Google. Nothing came up. No information remotely similar to the plot or the name of this episode existed anywhere. Now incredibly scared and wondering if anyone else was watching, I quickly dialed my brother Larry and asked him to turn on the Cartoon Network and see if he was seeing the same shit I was. He was pretty mad that I woke him up at this hour, but he's a nice guy and told me he would see for me. I thanked him and stayed on the line as the show came back from commercial break. The scene had thankfully panned away from the horrific sight of the children mutilated and was back to the principal's office. I asked Larry if he saw some cartoon animals talking or crying, since that's what they were doing on my TV. To my surprise, he said that he saw nothing like that. Instead, it was a rerun of an old Looney Tunes short. In utter shock, I dropped the phone and ran over the TV to turn it off. And as hard as I pressed the buttons, it would not shut off at all. I tried every single button, and none of them did a thing. I tried unplugging the whole thing as well, but nothing worked. The TV stayed on no matter what. Larry had hung up, assuming that I was playing a joke or something, I guess. And I was alone once again. My door was locked from the outside somehow, and the door to my bathroom was now locked as well. It seemed that I had no choice but to call the police, since my other family members were gone that night. There was a reason I could stay up so late to watch adults swim in the first place. When I hurriedly dialed the number, I accidentally dropped my cell phone into my cup of Pepsi. I was very scared. I had no choice but to finish the episode. I turned on all the lights in my room and got under the covers, hiding like my little brother does when I make him watch scary movies with me. It apparently missed a little bit, but Gumball's parents were still talking to Principal Brown, so not that much. Nicole was asking him if Gumball was alright, apparently since she hadn't remembered him when Principal Brown told her what had happened to Darwin and Anais. He looked slightly confused and shocked for a moment, and explained to her that he thought Gumball was out sick today and he'd spent the day at home by himself with a stomach bug. Nicole screamed and wailed, while Richard quietly told him, in a very out-of-character voice, that they thought Gumball had got on the bus this morning, but it didn't seem that way. The police were called once again to search the building and the small forest outside of Elmore Junior High. They'd found him in Miss Simeon's classroom, hanging by a noose, with a blood-covered knife behind him and blood covering his clothing. The episode ended with the shot of Gumball's dead body hanging there in the corner, fading to black. The credits rolled silently, not like the usual way Cartoon Network annoyingly airs a promo that squishes half the screen. These credits rolled unusually slow, and they weren't that fun to watch either. A little creepy. Just plain white text scrolling on a black background. I only recognize Ben Boclet's name, as he was the creator of the show. The rest were people I'd never heard of. The copyright notice at the end said Cartoon Network Studios 2001, which was incredibly odd seeing as the show was new as of 2011. After all that was over, the screen went to static for a split second, during which some incredibly creepy and shocking video clips were shown between static intervals. I can still remember them all very clearly. The first was a picture of a person in a plague doctor outfit. Those always scared me for some reason. The way the person in the suit was filmed was just as bad. A red light, something that freaks me out incredibly, was shown over the clip. 
The next was what seemed like a video being played very quickly, over and over of a kitten's face being squished by a woman wearing high heels, which was strange because a so-called friend of mine sent me a picture yesterday of a cat being stepped on and killed, similar to the kitten in the video. The last one was the one that disturbed me the most and made me both want to cry and vomit my guts out. It was my little brother, or at least a small child who looked very similar to him being shot in the face by a person who looked like my father. You could clearly see the child's brains and blood splatter on the wall. I began to sob uncontrollably after that traumatizing clip, so much so that I passed out. When I woke up, my door was unlocked and my television was turned off. I went to call the police on the home phone in my kitchen and report that I'd seen some very disturbing things on TV and that my doors had been locked. When they arrived, they could find nothing like what I remembered from early this morning. My internet history was even cleared, and they were angry at me. They just assumed that I had a bad nightmare when I was sure I hadn't. Thankfully, one of the officers felt bad for me and took me out to a small diner so I could recollect my thoughts. At the diner, I remember that my family was out visiting my aunt. They were supposed to be back by noon or so. It was already 11, so the officer and I drove back only to find a whole squad of police cars and even some government agents at my house. They explained to me that my little brother was missing and that my mother and father were major suspects. I was freaking out, trying to tell them about the disturbing clip of the boy who looked like my brother being shot in the head, but they wouldn't listen. I stayed with my older brother Larry, who wouldn't believe me either, still insisting that all he saw was an old Looney Tunes cartoon, and nothing at all creepy or weird. The cops eventually told me that they would contact Turner Broadcasting and tell them about the incident. A representative of Turner Broadcasting came to my cousin's house to talk to me in private about what I had seen and experienced that night. He was very kind, but it all seemed a little like some sort of front. After I could tell him all I remembered, he agreed to play back that day's programming from when the incident with the disturbing gumball episode had occurred. To my shock, all that was airing at that time was an old Looney Tunes short. Nothing more, nothing less. I hysterically sobbed and moaned that what I had experienced and seen was completely real. But no one listened. Eventually I discovered that Ben Boclet had a Twitter account, so I sent a message about the episode. And this was the reply I got. One thing. How in the heck did you find that? I never, ever, ever, I would think about that old shame again. Don't tell anyone this. But the amazing world of gumball goes back further than you know. I used to have a really boring job as a teen. And I sketched little drawings of the Watersons and friends. The episode you saw was never supposed to be seen by anyone but me and a few friends of mine. It was a very very awful thing to do. But we made the episode as a joke. A guy from my old job, who everyone hated, had lost a child to a crazy serial killer, who was apparently still out there somewhere. Anyway, we made it so we could make fun of how he came to work usually crying like a fool, which is why you saw Mr. and Mrs. Watterson crying so much in the episode. I know. I am deeply sorry for what I did, which is why I tried to bury that stupid thing years ago. Literally, I went out into the countryside with my mates and dug a hole and buried it. What I don't get, though, is how you describe the blood and guts and stuff. We didn't have any scene with Darwin and Anais' body being found. All that happens in the episode is the parents are informed of the kids being found dead and them crying like crazy. We didn't even draw anything in the episode like that at all. We're not that sick. Now, this is my theory. The lunatic, who killed the man's child and found the tape we buried, watched it, and heavily edited it. Then he hijacked the local TV station near... somehow, and got the episode to air on your local Cartoon Network station. Now, why your brother couldn't see it, I have no idea. Why it seems you're the only one who saw it, I have no idea either. Sorry, but I just don't know. Now, for the explanation you've been waiting for, the clips at the end, I don't know. I don't. I'm deeply sorry from the bottom of my heart, 
but I don't know why those clips were aired. I just don't. I'm sorry. I really am. But me and my mates are just the ones who made those scenes with Richard and Nicole crying. That's it. I'm so sorry. I'm so deeply sorry. Best wishes, Ben Boclet and everyone involved with The Grieving. For your bonus episode, Creepy Presents Candy Corn, written by Summer Harris and narrated by Alicia Atkins. Once again, I was stuck taking my annoying little brother and his equally annoying best friend trick-or-treating. Dad had to work a double and my mom was in the next town over, helping my aunt finish packing up for her upcoming move to our town. Mom sure was excited about having her sister closer. Not sure how Dad felt about it, though. The two of them didn't much like each other, but tried hard not to show it for Mom's sake if nothing else. Nobody thought to ask me if I had any plans for the night. I didn't, but they didn't know that. My girlfriend was out of town, and I had no interest in knocking over mailboxes and drinking warm beer with the rest of my friends. I had been planning on watching the most campy horror movie I could find, and stuffing my face with Cheetos and some of the mountain of Halloween candy we had in the house. But here I was. Greg came thumping down the stairs in the way that only a six-year-old can. He was already in his costume, Batman, of course, and I could tell right now that tonight was going to be a nightmare. He was bouncing off the walls already, and he didn't even have any sugar in him yet. Come on, let's go already! Greg half screamed. All right, all right, let's go and get this over with already. I muttered as I grabbed my jacket and headed towards the door. He scampered behind me as we walked down three houses to collect his friend, Lucas, jabbering away about all the candy he was going to get. Lucas came running up to us before we even made it halfway up his sidewalk. He was dressed like a pirate. I interrupted their excited chatter to get them moving. The quicker we started, the quicker it would be over. Come on, guys. You got one hour, so you better make the most of it. Greg just smiled at me, unconcerned. He knew that even though I obviously didn't want to be there, I wouldn't let him go home until his candy bucket was overflowing, either. The streets started filling up pretty quick. Little kids dressed like pumpkins were being chased around by frazzled parents, and the night filled with the sounds of kids squealing, crying, and making every other kind of noise you can think of. The people around here tended to give out the good candy, so we always had a lot of trick-or-treaters whose parents drove them over to score the more high-end treats. I can't blame them, but as a result, the street was jam-packed. We walked up and down the nearby streets, the kids sampling candy along the way and trading each other for their favorites. Greg was so busy chattering away to Lucas that he tripped over his own feet and most of his candy went flying. I stooped down to gather it up before any waterworks could start. I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye. When I turned to look, there was a man bending down to help scoop the candy up and return it to the now only half-full bucket. I thanked him as we stood up, Greg clutching his candy tightly. No problem at all, my boy. It's a pleasure to be of assistance on this very special night, he said in a raspy voice. I noticed then that he didn't appear to have any kids, but before I could say anything, he had disappeared into the crowd. His kids had probably just been with his wife or something but I kept the boys a little closer just in case he was some kind of weirdo. We didn't see him again, and I soon forgot all about the incident. The last house we went to had a bunch of those motion-activated ghosts and monsters out, and the boys got so scared they almost fell off the porch. Once I got done laughing my ass off at them, I told them it was time to head home. They didn't protest too much, though. I think they were getting tired but didn't want to admit it. They continued to swap their candy as we slowly walked back home. Ew! Gross! Greg said, pulling something out of his bucket. I peered over his shoulder to see what he was talking about. It was a small bag of candy corn. You either love it or you hate it. Pretty much no in between. 
Personally, I thought it tasted like little pieces of candle wax, and apparently Greg felt the same. Lucas snatched it from his hand, opened it, and began to eat it immediately. I love this stuff, he said as spit and pieces of candy flew out of his mouth. Greg just groaned, then waved goodbye as Lucas ran up the steps to his house and we continued home. I passed him off to my dad, grabbed a handful of candy, and headed upstairs. As I browsed for a movie to watch, I could hear Greg running around downstairs with his sugar high in full effect. At least I didn't have to deal with that, I thought to myself as I settled in. Nothing interesting happened over the next few days. Mom came home and Greg was just as annoying as ever. Sarah came back into town, so I'd been spending most of my free time after school with her. It was around a week later that I realized that I hadn't seen Lucas since Halloween night. That was a little strange, because he was usually over at our house at least a couple of times a week, except for the days that Greg was at his house. Come to think of it, I hadn't noticed Greg going over to his house either. When I got home from school, I mentioned it to Mom, and she told me that she had just talked to Lucas's mom, and that he'd been sick since Halloween. I hope he wasn't contagious when you and Greg were around him. They'd been to the doctor, but still haven't quite figured out what's going on. It started out like the flu, but now he's getting all these spots all over. I didn't think much more about it. I figured that if we hadn't started feeling sick by now, we were probably in the clear. Greg had been moping around for a few more days, bored without Lucas to hang out with. He had been spending most of his time in the treehouse Dad built for them at the edge of our backyard. I felt bad for the kid. Hopefully Lucas would be back here running around soon. Then with one phone call, everything changed. We were all sitting in the living room, watching TV when the call from Lucas's mom came in. I couldn't hear what was being said but I could tell Mom was upset by her tone of voice. She came into the living room and stopped the movie. I need to ask you something, Greg, she said in a strained voice. Have you seen Lucas or talked to him since trick-or-treating? No, Mommy. Why? It was then that Mom told us that Lucas had went missing during the night. There was no sign of a break-in, and the back door was standing open. It was assumed he got up during the night and wandered outside in his feverish state. The police had of course been called and were starting to search the woods and canvas the neighborhood. So far, there wasn't any sign of him. The woods that our street backed up to went back a good way, and even with volunteers, it was going to be next to impossible to search at all. Me and Dad went out to join the search immediately, while Mom stayed home to comfort Greg. He didn't fully understand what was happening, but he knew something bad was going on with his friend. We searched until it got too dark to see anything, then called it quits for the night. We came home exhausted and hadn't found so much as a footprint. The next morning, Dad went out to join the search again, and Mom was making coffee for all the volunteers. I stayed home with Greg, trying to distract him with ice cream for breakfast and cartoons. After a while, he asked if he could go out and play in the yard. It was fenced in, so I didn't worry too much about him wandering off, but still kept an eye on him. I called Mom to see if there was any news, but still nothing. I hung up the phone and realized it was about lunchtime. I went to the back door and yelled for Greg to come inside. I was grabbing some leftover pizza from the fridge when he came bursting through the back door. Guess what? Guess what? He yelled at me. I found Lucas, and he's a superhero now. My jaw dropped open as I tried to register what he said. You saw Lucas? I asked in disbelief. Yeah, he's in the treehouse. Come see. I briefly thought of calling Mom or the police, but I thought I should go see if he was really up there before getting everyone's hopes up. It seemed way too unbelievable that he'd been hiding out in our treehouse for days while everyone searched the woods and Greg moped around the house. Greg took off running across the yard with me not far behind. I followed him up the ladder and pulled myself into the treehouse properly. Before I could look around, I heard a strange clicking noise behind me. I turned and couldn't comprehend what I was seeing. Lucas was sitting there in the corner, 
still wearing his now filthy pajamas. But he was... wrong. The clicking sound that I'd heard was coming from what looked like pinchers that seemed to have taken the place of his hands. His skin was pale and covered in what I first thought were angry red sores. When I looked closer, I realized they were actually clusters of small, wet-looking holes. Bile rose up in my throat as I saw something move inside them. When my eyes rose to his face, I couldn't hold it back and turned to vomit onto the floor. A viscous fluid was oozing from his mouth and nose. He was trying to speak, but could manage nothing but a thick, gargling noise as he choked on the slime. But the worst part was his eyes. Besides the fact that they were a putrid shade of yellow, there were more of them than there should have been. Many, many more. They extended up his forehead and darted around frantically. See? I told you he was a superhero now. Like Spider-Man. Greg said excitedly. I had momentarily forgotten about him in my shock. I quickly grabbed his arm before he could get any closer, and practically shoved him through the hole in the floor to the ladder. I skipped the ladder altogether and just jumped down. I twisted my ankle in the process, but didn't even notice until the next day. I dragged Greg across the yard, and down the road to where the police and the searchers were, amidst his protest. What happened afterwards was a blur of police and paramedics. No one knew what to say. He was shipped off in an ambulance, but they wouldn't let anyone ride with him in case whatever was happening to him was contagious. We all walked silently back to the house, with Greg asking a million questions. He couldn't understand why we weren't more excited to have not only found Lucas, but the fact that he had turned into a superhero. The next day, some very official-looking men showed up at our door. They said that they were collecting information for the CDC, but we all knew better. They asked me even more questions than the cops had. Greg, too. Once they had wrung every scrap of information out of us they could get, they left. We never found out exactly who they were, but they made it very clear that we were to keep our mouths shut about the whole ordeal. Greg didn't really get it, but he was just a little kid, so no one that hadn't been there took him too seriously. They just figured he had made up something to deal with the trauma of what happened to his best friend. We didn't see Lucas again. His parents left just a few days later, and we never saw them again either. I overheard a whispered conversation between Mom and Dad afterward. Some sort of larva had been found in Lucas's body that had actually changed his cellular structure. It was thought that he had consumed something containing eggs, or a contaminant from an insect they had yet to identify. They couldn't figure out where it came from, but I thought I knew. It had to have been from something he had eaten Halloween night, the day before he fell ill. Greg had eaten just as much, if not more, of the collected candy. Everything except the candy corn that he had given to Lucas. I thought again of the odd stranger that had helped Greg pick up his fallen candy. He must have slipped the candy corn in with the rest of it. I shuddered as I thought how easily that could have been my little brother. We never heard anything about Lucas and his family again, and I don't think we ever will. I never saw the stranger again, either, and I hope that I never do. For more information on this podcast, including how to submit your own story for consideration, please visit creepypod.com. You can also follow us at Creepypod on social media and YouTube. All stories told on this podcast are done so through Creative Commons share-alike licensing or with written consent from the authors. No portion of this podcast may be rebroadcast or otherwise distributed without the express written consent of the Creepy Podcast production team and the story's author.